This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Rappaport to the Rescue with award-winning animal advocate, best-selling author, journalist, and pet products creator, Jill Rappaport. Hi, welcome to Rappaport to the Rescue. I'm Jill Rappaport. And you know, I don't throw the word legend around lightly, but today we have a true legend on the show in the world of theater. Daryl Roth is a 13-time Tony Award-winning Broadway producer and a visionary genius in American theater with a career spanning over so many decades and credited with some of the most thought-provoking productions in the Big Apple and throughout the world. Daryl Roth also holds the mind-boggling distinction of producing seven Pulitzer Prize-winning plays. And among the more than 130 shows, did you hear that number, 130? She has produced both on and off Broadway. She is here today to talk about her latest production called Left on 10th, based on the wonderful memoir by Delia Afrin and directed by the incredible and beloved Susan Stroman. And let's not forget, there's even a theater named after her. The Daryl Roth Theater is the landmark off-Broadway venue on Union Square. She is dedicated to supporting a number of nonprofit organizations. And Daryl Roth has been inducted into the 2017 Theater Hall of Fame and named to Crane's 2019 50 Most Powerful Women in New York. But you know me, guys. Why I just had to get around Rappaport to the rescue is because this powerhouse producer is also a major animal advocate who has devoted so much of her life and whatever time she has to saving animals in need. In fact, I truly fell in love with Daryl when she came out with the most amazing documentary called My Dog, An Unconditional Love Story. So when we come back, I am so thrilled to have the legend, Daryl Roth on Rappaport to the Rescue. Stay tuned. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Dot com. <laughs> Welcome back to Rappaport to the Rescue. Now, if you heard all the accolades, the attributes, all the incredible things my next guest has done, and I said she is a true legend, and she is here with us right now. Daryl Roth, I've been wanting to get you on this podcast. I have admired you for decades. You are truly an unbelievable pioneer in so many areas, and you really changed the landscape of Broadway. Oh, my God, dear. That is the most beautiful introduction a a person could hope for. I just thank you. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for all that. Well, you are unbelievable because you never stop. I mean, it's one thing to have all of these Tonys, to have these Pulitzer Prizes, to have a theater named after you. You are unbelievable force of light and energy. What keeps you going? Ah, thank you for that. Well, I think Perhaps it was the fact that I didn't really get into this profession until I was in my mid-40s. And so when you start something a little bit later, I think there's an urgency and there's a sense of, I know I want to do this. I'm going to be as tenacious as it takes. I love it. I'm passionate. I'm dedicated. And I will never give up. And I think you have a different sense of that when you start at the middle of your life. And perhaps that's it. But I, I mean, part of it is that that's my nature. You know, my nature is to find something that I love and just do the best I can at it. And, you know, you mentioned that you started in your 40s. And I said in my intro, you've been at it and successful for many decades. That is true. (laughs) Everything, obviously, 
works for you because you are like Dorian Gray, sweetheart. You are aging backwards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is the kindest thing to say. Don't look too close and the lighting is lovely. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it's funny you mentioned Dorian Gray because that's one of the one of the productions I'll be involved with in March here in New York. Having done it in London with the wonderful Sarah Snook, who everyone hopefully knows from Succession and her wonderful talent. So Dorian Gray is actually coming up, which is funny that you referenced it. Dorian Gray, a.k.a. Daryl Roth. (laughs) What you've done for theater and people that you have focused on and they flourished under your tutelage and just working with you and your productions and the heart and soul that goes into these, it's truly amazing. And what do you think it is about you? I know you started later in life, but you treat, to me, an outsider looking in, it seems like you every new production like it's your audition tape. That's interesting. I think I feel that every new production, every new play, every new group of people that I can, you know, come to work with, it's like my next family in a way. I feel that part of my success, if I may say, is that I treat everyone as if they are in my family with, you know, as much respect and dignity and appreciation as I can, partially because I'm in awe of their talent and partially because I think people can flourish much better in an atmosphere that is, you know, one of love and appreciation. And it's a hard life. Anyone that chooses to be in the theater business, I don't mean as a producer, though that's pretty challenging these days as well, but people that are artists, they unzip their souls at every moment. And to me, that's just such a generous and gracious thing. And and I feel it has to be treasured. It's been the way that I've wanted to offer my appreciation because I love the art of theater so deeply. And I, I just am in awe of the people that are part of it. It's enriched my life. And, you know, being able to choose things to produce that I feel are of value for one reason or another, Either it's because it's the story that I feel I would love to share with people, whether it's about women, whether it's about gender, identity, my Jewish heritage, family dynamics, whatever it is, it's something that means something to me. And my hope is that, you know, given the opportunity to share it with people, it will mean something to them. So that's what keeps me going, I guess. When you think about during COVID, Broadway shut down, everything shut down and it went dark, literally. Well, interesting to mention that because, well, it did go dark and it was devastating to try to keep everyone afloat, literally. We opened up with the first production off-Broadway of a play called Blindness, and it was remarkable. The reason we were able to do it is because it was done without any cast. You had earphones and you heard the words of Juliet Stevenson telling you this beautiful story. Luckily, I have a theater that is a very flexible space, and we were able to seat people far enough away from one another in pairs. And with the earphones, they had gotten the story directly. We had every sanitation opportunity taken care of, and people came together in a way that was so celebratory. It was the first time a theater opened after COVID. And part of the story was so breathtaking because it was actually about an epidemic. And it was about a city that had to just close and find its way. And at the end of the production, the way it was staged, we were able to open the doors of the theater, which, by the way, everyone was sitting in darkness. That was part of the beauty of it, or I should say the um, experience of it. It was dark, and you were listening to these beautiful melodic words. And then at the end, the doors to our theater opened up onto Union Square and bright light came in, bright sunlight came in. It was extraordinary. It was really something great. It was very powerful, very powerful. And we were lucky because we were able to do something like that, which, you know, still observed all the COVID protocols. People wore masks. They didn't sit next to each other. Everything was sanitized. I mean, we were, you know, floating in Purell. It was wonderful. (laughs) (laughs) You know, when looking at your resume, all of the Tonys, all of the shows, the awards, it's like asking you which child is your favorite. But I have to ask you, of all of the shows, is there one that really resonates with your heart the most? You're right. It's hard to choose. It's, you know, because you love all the children in equal measure. But if I could limit it to just a few and not one, 
that made a huge difference, not only in my life, but in the lives of the people that got to experience it. I would say Kinky Boots was a really big one for me, primarily because it was based on a film that I saw at the Sundance Institute many years ago. And as I was sitting there watching it, I hadn't really thought about theater. I was just there as a Sundance board member. And the name you know, interested me. I said, Kinky Boots, what could that be? I'm going to go see that film, <laughs> having no knowledge of it. And I sat there thinking to myself, this is like piercing my heart. This is a story that has everything I want to tell, everything that was important to me. It was about being true to yourself. It was about being honorable and respectful of other people that were different than you. It was about being, you know, celebratory in life against all odds. Well, I got out of there at the mountaintop that I was in, and this is so many years ago that the cell phone that I borrowed was like probably weighed 10 pounds. And I screamed <laughs> into the phone and stand up. And there was no no cell service in the middle of Utah at the time. Anyway, I managed to reach my son, Jordan, and I said, Jordan, I have just had an unbelievable experience. I have to get the rights for this little movie named Kinky Boots. I'm going to be in Utah for a few more days. I saw that one of the producers of the film was Disney. Please, please call Tom Schumacher and say, my mom is crazy in Utah. She's got to get the rights for Kinky Boots. <laughs> well, that wasn't so easy. It did take quite a few years because it had to be, a, it was a combination Miramax Disney film, and they had to decide who would end up with the theater rights. Now, fortunately for me, Disney decided it was not a family musical, which I think, curiously, it ended up being quite a wonderful family musical because of the lessons and the message. But in the beginning, it was Kinky Boots, which, you know, with drag queens. So that was not so easy to peg as a family musical. It turned out, after all these many years of presenting it, that it brought more families together and acted as a way, a catalyst for people to talk to their parents, especially if they were coming out or if they were trying to just express themselves differently than their families, you know, had expected or predicted. So in in fact it was a gorgeous message. But that to me made such a difference in the world. And it also gave Cindy Lauper her first opportunity to write a musical. I've always been a fan of hers, especially because of her, you know, women centric music and and to work with Harvey Firestein and Jerry Mitchell. It was just A1 fabulous from the beginning to the end. And because I was involved in you know such a complete way, I felt as though everything that I cared about was riding on this. So happily, it turned out to be successful. And in a very competitive year, it, it did win the Tony. But more than that, it won the hearts of so many people. And it's still done all over the world. I think it's been in Korea four times in Japan. And I mean, it's about the message. And it's a message that never gets stale. And that is, be true to yourself, be kind to others, do your thing, just be. That's one of the big songs, just be who you want to be, live your life with dignity. And to me, you know, I'd have to put that at the top of my list. Well, absolutely. And besides changing lives, I know you must believe that it probably saved lives. I would go so far as to say that, yes, I would. I know how difficult it is for young people to, you know, come out to their families and how it's a devastating, sadly, uh, situation for some people who feel they never can. And I know that we got many letters and people saying to us how having the experience of going to the theater with their child, with their son, with their daughter, and then being able to talk about things more openly and, and more freely and more honestly was actually the key that unlocked that was watching Kinky Boots. That's remarkable. Oh, you know? So that's on my list for sure. I'm so proud of it. And I'm also very proud of some of the other shows in different ways. For example, I did the revival of Larry Kramer's Normal Heart. And after 25 years, you know, I saw it 25 years before we produced the revival. And that too, in a similar way to Kinky Boots, made people realize how much there is to do in the world that can make a difference and can help. You know, I was very excited to do the production because it was speaking to a younger generation on whose shoulders they stood, but they didn't really know the story. And that brought it to light in such a glorious way. So many young people started volunteering for GMHC or God's Love We Deliver. A million doors were open to these people that 
were inspired by seeing Larry Kramer's play. I like to say it was his righteous rage. And righteous rage to me is really valuable in our society, especially today. So I put that up in the top of the list. And I would also add, if I might, I know your question was, do you have one child? But I don't. Um, (laughs) I would put the play wit and I would put the play indecent as part of my top tier because wit was a play that nobody else wanted to tackle. It was a play about a woman living with ovarian cancer. Uh, one woman show, Kathleen Chalfont, if you remember, and then Judith Light brilliantly took over the role. And it opened up so many wonderful conversations among medical professionals, survivors, caregivers. It was just an open dialogue about the cancer that nobody wanted to talk about in those days. You know, we called it the C word, which is so interesting because now, as we speak, I'm doing a play called Left on Tenth. It's kind of the bookend. I've often thought that. Left on 10th is the child of year of magical thinking and wit in some bizarre fashion. But, you know, it's a true story. It's Delia Efron's memoir adapted to stage. And it, too, deals with having a real challenging illness, in this case, cancer again, leukemia, but having gone through it and coming out on the bright side of life. In other words, she's now cancer-free. She's in love for a second time, having had a wonderful marriage for many years. And after her husband passed away, she met another wonderful man. And it was just for me to do a play about second chances in life and love, especially for a generation that has not often served up stories that are relevant on stage, was really important to me. And so it's funny, but it has that thread, that sort of woven tapestry that that goes from Year of Magical Thinking, Wit, and now to Left on Ten. And then Indecent, which is Paula Vogel's magnificent, beautiful story about art through the ages and how art is what must live to keep our culture alive, was really quite an extraordinary experience. And um, so I guess I love everything I do. I, I would have to retire if I didn't. <laughs> but those are some top favorites, I guess, to answer the question. Well, you know what's amazing, Daryl? I look at you. You really are producing life-changing entertainment. Well, that's very interesting of you to say that. I think people do come to the theater in the hopes of being entertained first, but I hope they can leave the theater with something that really could be life-changing. You know, maybe the way you think about something, or maybe the way you deal with a challenge in your own life, or maybe the way you just open up to somebody else that you, you know, have issues with. I think, I don't know, I'm just so passionate about what theater can do. I remember talking to Edward Albee, who I was honored to have produced Three Tall Women and The Goater, who was Sylvia, and just having a, the opportunity to be in his face was remarkable. And he used to say to me that, you know, you can do something because you want to please people, or you can do something because you want to help people. And I thought, yes. I get that. I want to do both. I want to please people. I want to entertain them. And I want to help them see the world in a different way. I want them to open up, you know, their hearts, their minds, not in a spinachy way, I don't mean, but be open. I mean, Edward was a remarkable, remarkable playwright. And I remember when we did The Goat or Who is Sylvia, everyone would say, oh my God, this is a play about bestiality. And I would say, no, 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 this is a play about love. This is a play where Edward, I believe, is saying, the love that you choose is your personal love. That is not up for anybody else's opinion. It's not the love of a goat. It's just the love of an unforbidden love. And, you know, things like that really get into the psyche of the the culture, I believe, in ways that shake some people up and they bother some people. But more than that, I think they get people thinking, which is great, just great. Well, besides everything you've done professionally, when I began to adore you was when you came out with that documentary, My Dog. It was so unbelievable. People's connections. Yeah. And, you know, the old expression, who rescued who? And you and I know this all too well. I mean, I don't have human children. I have her children. Yeah. But I feel I love them. I care for them. I need them. I feel the same way my friends and he needs their children, you know? So you know that connection all too well. And I have children. 
I have children, but I feel exactly the same way about my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been so passionate and supportive of animal rescue. Tell me how that started in your life, Gerald. Well, I think it started long ago. When I was growing up in New Jersey, my parents both loved animals so much, and my father would always somehow come home with rescue dogs. We always had purebred collies. That was our family dog. And, oh, we, and they lived forever. And when they passed on to heaven, we got another collie. That was just what it was. But my dad, may he rest in peace, had a car agency. And oftentimes people would come in and they just like bring animals in. And he would say, well, is this your dog? And they'd say, well, no, I, I found this dog on the street, but I know that you love animals. And they would bring my dad these dogs. And I'm going back, you know, 60, 70 years. No, but I didn't know about rescue animals. I just knew that we always had these new family members in our house. And so I think my love of rescue really began with my father's kindness and understanding. And I always loved dogs. And um, growing up, I always, we always had dogs. And when I was married and had children, there was no question that I would always have dogs. In fact, when I married my husband, he was not a dog lover. In fact, I, I always loved the story on our first date in New York over, well, I married 55 years. I can barely believe that I'm saying that. But on our first date, I asked if he would walk the dog with me around, you know, around the corner when we got home. It was late at night in New York City. And he said, no, I have no interest in that. Oh, I would have dumped him, Daryl. Did. Oh, I totally did. That was the first and last time I saw him until about a year later when we were reintroduced. And I said, how do you feel about dogs these days? <laughs> anyway, we managed to uh, find a common ground. And of course, he loves our dogs now. But um, I have two dogs now. And um, my daughter has two dogs. My son, I finally talked into getting a cute little dog for his young eight-year-old son. So we're totally a dog family. But what I find so fulfilling is being able to connect people with, with the shelters that, you know, that I respect and know and make those connections. I think over the last year, I must have placed about 15 dogs. And I, I mean, that gives me the best feeling ever. I have a lovely gentleman that Bernadette Peters, you know, Broadway Barks, of course, you know, I've supported for a long time and love when, Bernadette. One of my dogs passed away and I wanted to rescue a dog. And so I called Bernadette and I said, you know, you know, all these wonderful shelters, who would you recommend I work with? And she gave me the name of Bill Smith, whose organization is outside of Philadelphia called One Love for Animals, number one, number four, One Love for Animals. And she said to me, you're going to love Bill because he loves theater. He drives up from Philadelphia once a week to see theater. I said, he's my guy. <laughs> <laughs> I go back many years with Bill. And you're right about saying it's very important to know the rescues that you support because you have to know who you're working with. You yeah. have to make sure that they're in it. It's their life, their oxygen, like it is for us because you don't always know everybody across the country. So I always make sure I go to visit the groups that I support. But in the Hamptons, Southampton Animal Shelter, I've been working on a campaign the whole year, a home for the holidays and after, where I took 17 underdogs, the seniors, the pits, the special needs that nobody was adopting. And we have one left. I've gotten everyone a home. And it's such a challenging time now, Daryl. Oh, my God. And I was able to get reconnected with you with this show, Left on 10th, is the wonderful Bill Berloni. You have rescue dogs in this show. Exactly. Exactly. That was totally the way we were going. The story calls for a dog named Honey and a dog named Charlie. And, you know, Bill's wonderful. And he's the go-to guy for theater. That's animals, but he has such a big heart and I've always admired him. I first met him around the days of, of Annie when he was when he found Sandy. You know, I think that was the probably the beginning for him too. But he just has a kind heart. He's wonderful. These two rescues, actually it's a funny story, I have to say, off the record maybe, but maybe it's interesting. The first honey that we had was a beautiful blonde mixture of whatever. And she was in the rehearsal Paul with us during our whole rehearsal. And when we got moved into the theater for tech and everything seemed fine. And with the first preview audiences, Honey got a little bit nervous. It was the applause and the sound of, you know, people and, and the noise that wasn't in a quiet, empty rehearsal room. And so she became a little frightened and nervous. And Bill suggested, really, we should, we'll find another 
rescue. So we like to say we have our understudy who became a star in <laughs> Nessa Rose is her real name, but she plays Honey. And she's more of a veteran. Bill explained to us that she had been she had been in Wicked, so she was used to being on stage and having applause. It didn't frighten her. And then our adorable Charlie is also a rescue, and he is the funniest, most adorable dog with a little overbite. I mean, you just fall in love with these. As soon as they walk on stage, the audience goes, oh, ah, you know. And of course, we have the most gorgeous and marvelous, talented cast. Everyone does their curtain call. And when the dogs come out for their curtain call, it's the loudest standing up ovation. <laughs> Even a bigger ovation than the stars Juliana Margulies and Peter Gallagher get? They're so good with the dogs. That's the beauty. In fact, all of our rehearsal time was spent with Bill, you know, making sure that the dogs were comfortable with Juliana and Peter. And um, they love them. At the end of every show, they run into their dressing rooms and they each give them their little liver treats or whatever beefy treats they get. And they get a big hug and a lick and a kiss. And it's been glorious. You know, look, there's nothing like a dog or dogs in this case to lighten your heart and your life, especially because Left on 10th, you know, it has a heavy, challenging chapter yeah. of the story. And what it is about is the second chance in life and love. And so being able to give a rescue dog a second life is also another part of, I think, the wonder of this play. Or just for us personally, those of us that know these dogs are getting a second chance. They're Broadway stars. Bill takes them, literally, some off the street. Literally. And our audience should know that all of these animals that Bill finds... He keeps for the rest of their lives in his amazing, I call it Noah's Ark. It's just unbelievable. They are rescued and loved and taken care of forever. And then they go on to entertain amazing audiences. Yeah. And bless you, Daryl, for understanding the need and the importance of putting these rescues in the show. I would love to collaborate with you on something for animal welfare. I would be happy to. It would make me really happy to do something with you about this. It's dear to my heart. I know it's your entire being. You've been so wonderful about everything and bringing awareness to people about rescuing. And I've had only the best experiences. And everybody that I have found a rescue dog, either through Bill or other you know, people that I've been in touch with, Everyone has thanked me for the experience, life-changing for them. Especially, you know, sometimes it's the first dog they ever had. Sometimes it's a dog that's, you know, coming after the passing of a long-term pet. That's hard. But once they get ready and then they understand rescuing can be so much more meaningful, not only for the pup, but for themselves. It's just something beautiful to see and experience. So I'm, I'm available to help you in any way I can. Well, I have to tell you, you are a true inspiration. I appreciate that. I really appreciate your kind words. For me, if it were up to me, my life would be about my family, theater, and dogs, and I would feel complete. <laughs> That's a perfect way to end. Daryl, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who tuned in today to Rappaport to the Rescue. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand only on PetLifeRadio.com.